in the 1970s, this woman right over here, Mary Ainsworth, was thinking a lot about how children get attached to their parents, the type of relationship that even very young babies, just, you know, newborns, um, have a very deep attachment to their primary caregiver, whether it's their parents or adoptive parents or their uncle or their older cousin, whoever it may be that takes care of them the most, they really, really uh, tend to cling to them very tightly and have a strong emotional bond. And this had already been identified as being called attachment. Attachment by John Bowlby previously. But Mary Ainsworth wanted to go a little bit more into it. She wanted to uh, try to uncover some more aspects of what this attachment means and how, and maybe different types of attachment. So she came up with this experiment, and she called it the strange situation. Situation. And so the uh, thing she was trying to figure out here was the different types of attachment to the primary caregivers. And her method for doing that was to see how the child responded to being separated from the parent. I'm using the word parent a lot, but I should be saying caregiver because uh, it doesn't have to be the parent. So excuse me if I make that mistake again. And they would be put into a strange room, like a, a very small, you know, a couple of chairs and some toys on the floor. It, it, not much to go off of. It wasn't like a house or anything. It sort of looked like a doctor's office. That's what the kid might have thought it was. And then the situational part is that they, the parent, not the parent, the caregiver, the attached caregiver, would enter and come back, and also a stranger would enter and come back in these phases. Uh, there are eight of them, seven or eight, and there's three minutes each, so it came out to about 20 minutes. It was not a very long procedure. So phase one was just the parent and the infant enter. Uh, the caregiver and the parent and the infant enter the room. So this is just to get the the infant, and you got to picture, you know, little babies they're doing this experiment on, because if they're old enough to talk, then, then they can just say, oh, I don't care about my mom, or, or they say, I do care very deeply about my mom. Um, and that's why they used infants. And the second episode, episode is the actual word, or the second phase, is the parent and infant just sit there alone. And so, you know, they walk in, and then this is the first section of three minutes, you could say, and the parent just sits there. The parent just sits in the chair and reads a book or looks at the newspaper, uh, and, and the infant plays with the toys, and then Mary Ainsworth, or whoever's doing the experiment, um, sits in the next room behind some mirrored glass and with some video cameras and they watch the proceedings and take notes on it because if you didn't write it down it wouldn't really be science. And then phase three, this next thing, is a stranger enters. And this could be another experimenter or another volunteer. Stranger enters. And they again they observe the experimenters observe what happens to the infant. Does she? Does the infant mind that the stranger in for enters? Does she kind of make friends with him? Um, how do they interact? Number four, because we're trying to figure out if the if the parent is a lot different than just a stranger. If they actually have a very tight bond here, I'll start putting dots. Number four, the parent leaves. leaves. So you imagine now uh, the, the, the infant thinks that they're at the doctor's office or something. 
you know, the the parent, mom or dad, brought them in, sat them down, they played with the toys in, in the waiting room for a little while, and then a stranger comes in, no big deal, and then the parent leaves, and this may or may not cause some stress. I'm going to pick a different color while I'm at it. This is going to cause some stress, at least most likely, depending on the type of attachment that we are seeing. The typical uh, would be that the the infant may start crying if all of a sudden the their primary caregiver just up and walks away. They're going to feel they're going to feel abandoned. Um, so I'm just going to pick a slightly different color for more interest. Number five is a reunion phase. This just means that reunion. This just means that the parent comes back. Uh, so, you know, maybe they went up to the desk to get the paperwork to fill out or, or whatever the child thinks is going on, if they think about it that hard. Regardless, they are happy to see their parent. That's the key to number five. Uh, and of course, the experimenters are still watching and they see, you know, does, does the child get overjoyed by seeing their parent again? They think all is right with the world. Or does the kid not really care that much? Are they just like, oh, hi mom, I see that you're back, that's cool. I'm going to keep playing with my toys. That's what we're talking about with different types of attachment. Number six is the infant is alone or both people leave. The stranger and the caregiver, the one who brought them to the experimenting place, both leave, the child is alone, and, as you could imagine, this causes a lot of stress as well. Or if the first one did, this one definitely will. They they don't have anybody around. They you know, if you've if you've ever seen a baby left all alone, they sometimes panic here. Even uh, my dog panics when we all leave. He's like, "Who's going to feed me for the rest of my life?" They they can't see that far ahead. So, yeah, this could be the most traumatic part of the experiment and ethically they have to um call this off or or end this stage shortly if the baby really is having a big problem with it. They always have, the parent and the experimenters both have the option to say, all right, that's enough. Let's go in there. And then stage seven, the stranger comes back, and this is where it gets interesting. This is the first time that the stranger, oh, well, after this big stress, the, right here, the, uh, the child was alone with the stranger as well, but this is coming from alone to being with the stranger. So you can see the order of all these is just to give a bunch of different micro situations really fast. They're just, you know, oh, your parents here, now she's not going through them really fast. And so the stranger comes back and tries to console the the infant console because she's probably crying by now, the baby is. I keep saying she for the baby, but obviously this can be done on either gender. And then the last one, the last phase of the experiment is the parent comes back. And again they measure how happy the kid is. How happy. How exuberant the child is that their parent has returned. So based on these eight phases of different situations, the strange situations of parents coming and leaving, we see a few different attachment styles. I think I'll put them off here and talk about them quickly. So the one that I mostly referred to as the, the I don't want to say the one that we're going for, the good one, it's not better than the other ones, but the one that's most typical and the one that we sort of think of when we think about a, a good parent-child relationship. Um, whatever that means about our personal psyche, is the secure attachment, which means that the child really feels secure about their uh, their situation with their parent. They feel like if they leave for a second, they're probably going to come back. Um, if they need something from the parent, if they hurt themselves or if they get, get hungry, then the parent is probably going to feed them or help them, give them a Band-Aid. So they, this is a... I don't want to say ideal, but it's it's better for the 
the child's well-being, I would think. So that's the first one, secure. And then we're moving on to gotta pick a new color. Anxious. This one's a little longer. Anxious. Resistant. Re resistant. And it's also called ambivalent. So I'll write that. Ambivalent. Ambiv. Lent. Okay, so it used to be called anxious, which I need a U in there, or and and it's now been replaced with ambivalent resistant. And the word ambivalent is a little more clear. That just means if you're ambivalent, it's one way or the other. It's like ambidextrous, right hand or the left hand. Ambivalent towards your parent would mean maybe maybe my parents here, maybe she's not. Doesn't make much difference to me. And resistant, of course, is that you are actually resisting them. So anything from I don't care to I'd rather not have you in the room would fit into this. Well, resistant doesn't mean I wouldn't have you in the room, but just um, if the parent tries to pick them up, they might not cooperate. If you've ever tried to pick up a child who doesn't particularly want to be picked up, then you know that they just kind of go limp and slide out of your arms and it's hard to hold on to them. This middle one, this anxious ambivalent, I think of as how a cat acts. A cat doesn't care if you're in the room or not, and if you try to pick them up when they don't want to be, you, um, you know, you're going to have a rough time with it. That's just my thinking on it. You can use that if you want. And the final one, the, the, the last one here, is anxious they kept the word anxious for this one. Avoidant. Avoidant. So you know what the word avoid means. They're actually avoiding their parents. The, their parents uh, don't always attend to their needs right away, if at all, and and they're anxious most of the time. So you can see this creates a little bit of a an unsatisfactory situation for the child. If, if they have an anxious avoidant relationship with their parents, then, then it probably didn't affect them very much to have the stranger versus the parent. Um, you know, their parents are almost on the same level as a stranger in this situation.